let's talk about lead poisoning. So lead is toxic to the body at any level and it generally enters the body through ingestion through the GI tract or inhalation. In children, lead dust is the primary source of entry. So risk factors for exposure to lead include children under the age of six years old, and they have an incomplete blood-brain barrier uh, which will permit lead entry. Even younger kids that are crawling and have hand-to-mouth behavior will have even higher risk for lead exposure. Uh, being in a house built before 1978 is also a risk for lead exposure due to lead painted surfaces. Lead in paint was banned in 1978. Iron deficiency can also increase your risk for lead toxicity because it increases lead absorption. And workplace exposures can also happen, particularly in people who are working in factories making batteries or if they're in mining or smelting. So what will you see? The children can have slower cognitive development. They can have irritability or lethargy or headache. They can also develop abdominal pain and vomiting and constipation. Peripheral neuropathy is a little more rare, but when it happens, usually They'll talk about having a wrist drop or foot drop. There can be high frequency hearing loss. With chronic exposure, they can, there can be chronic interstitial nephritis as well as lead lines at the gums, which is pretty rare. There can also be a mild anemia, which is hemolytic and normocytic. However, with iron deficiency at the same time, it can also be microcytic. In a question, they might show you a picture where the erythrocytes in their cytoplasm, they have basophilic stippling, and that can be a sign of lead exposure, though it's not specific. And with high levels of lead, uh, greater than 100, then you can have acute onset encephalopathy and seizures and ataxia. The diagnosis is fairly straightforward. A venous blood level of greater than 5 establishes the diagnosis. If the diagnosis is established, iron deficiency is also screened for. The other household members also need to be tested for lead exposure, as they can be exposed to the same sources of lead. Treatment can be started prior to obtaining the lab results, especially if severe lead toxicity is suspected, such as if they're having an acute encephalopathy or seizures or acute onset vomiting. A abdominal x-ray is done, especially in young children where ingestion is suspected, and a CT head is done for encephalopathy to assess for elevated intracranial pressure. If there is elevated intracranial pressure, caution if doing a lumbar puncture. So for the treatment, so treatment is usually given to patients who are asymptomatic with a lead level of greater than 45 or for symptomatic. And this is generally for children. The chelation is done with succimer or calcium disodium editate and these medications will increase the urinary excretion of lead. Now if on the abdominal x-ray sources of lead such as specks of lead is found in the small bowel then whole bowel irrigation is done and for seizures benzodiazepines are the treatment of choice. For follow-up blood lead levels are repeated because a rise in the lead level will lead to needing repeat chelation therapy. Uh, treating iron deficiency is also important. Uh, this should happen after chelation, not during chelation. And there can be more permanent neurocognitive deficits, so children are followed up to see if they have developmental delay and early intervention services may be helpful for that. Patients are also counseled on how to remove lead sources from the home, and mothers with a lead level above 40 are counseled not to breastfeed. The prognosis 
it's better if you get treatment uh, however there can be neurocognitive and neurobehavioral effects which are permanent such as lower IQ the lower IQ can also be in a child of someone that had lead toxicity